Well, hello there, friends. This is what you've all asked for, a, a short video. My name is Rachel G. Inez Middle. Gilbert and Sullivan is my middle name, and my middle name is my last name. And I'm here today on behalf of Full Bear Theatre to explore the magic of the Gilbert and Sullivan operas by very pedantically ranking every element of them. And this is quite a special one today with the help of a uh, very good friend and soprano, Joanna Brabs. I have realised that we have actually missed several numbers in the GNS opera. Oh, actually, also, uh, Jesse Bond, who has come back from the dead to tell me that I've, that I've missed one. And these will, so I can definitely see why I missed the one that Jesse Bond told me about, Pinafore's on track. Just the bit that comes on before Fair Moon to the Eye Sing. And it is basically uh, a regurgitation I wish I could use a nicer word than that, but that's what comes to mind of Buttercup's aria in Act One at the very start. But it is, I would say, musically more beautiful than the plain aria on its own. And it's very dreamlike. When I directed this opera recently, I used that to be like a little dream sequence for Buttercup where she uh, imagine she was dancing with the captain and to, to me it's always kind of meant that back when I played Buttercup my first ever GNS principal role that that's just always what I thought it was it's just this moment where Buttercup ha well she thinks she has the ship to herself and she's just imagining what it would be like to actually be with the captain that that's the way I see that music so I think it's gorgeous it's dreamlike Mwah. Thank you, Jesse Bond, for reminding me that I hadn't talked about that one. I imagine that that might rank in the overall musical numbers list, because I've actually already made the Which Opera Has the Best Music video. I don't think this would be enough to elevate Pinafore above the next one, but I do think this one would boost it slightly, because this is really lovely musically, I think, this moment. So I think this would rank above average in the overall Pinafore musical numbers, but I don't think it would be enough to pull it above the one that is above it in the list. But thank you, Jesse Bond. I'm very glad you brought that one to my attention. Another musical number that Joanna Brabs brought to my attention is the Tarantella from Utopia Limited. Now, this one, I think of anything, wouldn't help Utopia Limited. I don't think it's a bad piece of music. It's very functional. When I was ranking the GNS operas purely for their music, which I've already filmed but not published yet, I remember deliberately taking out my papa from the gondoliers from that list because I thought, you know what, I shouldn't ever have included that. <laughs> it was really silly. Because the thing is, that number was designed to be purely functional. It's, it's serving a very specific purpose. And I think this Tarantella, it's it's musically, it, it's great. But just to me, it's very forgettable, hence why I forgot about it. I had fun dancing to it. I think we've actually talked about the Tarantella already on a different video. And I even showed you a clip from me and William Rummers dancing in the Tarantella when we played King Paramount and Princess Zara back in April. I would say that this music is quite reminiscent of the style of music in the gondoliers, but I would say that it doesn't have the imagination that any of the music in the gondoliers has. So when, when you think about with that, that little tambourine in the act one finale, that one just seems to have a lot more imagination to it than this one. Maybe that's unfair, but I didn't I never really think about the Tarantella as like a good piece of music. I see it as a fun, functional number to get everyone dancing. Would this have dragged the Utopia Limited ranking down one? I don't think so. Utopia Limited beat the one below it by several points, so I think it would have taken quite a lot for this one to drag it down. The other number that nobody guessed that, I, that I'd forgotten, but I, I did forget it, is... What immediately follows Constance's aria in the second act in The Sorcerer? Oh joy, oh joy, the charm works well. And then it goes, oh bitter joy, no words can tell. In my opinion, one of the most forgettable moments of The Sorcerer. However, I do, I do not think it is at all bad. It is just forgettable in the sense that it is it immediately follows a much more famous song. Interestingly enough, when I was in the chorus for The Sorcerer back in 2007, I think it was, I just didn't know the Sorcerer at all, so I was learning it totally cold. 
and I flat out didn't even realise this bit existed. So historically, this one for me has been quite forgettable. When I played Constance, it, it was quite fun. I, I, what I had fun doing is making that a bit of like an, a moment of awakening for Constance where she hears Alexis going, oh joy, oh joy, the charm works well. And she's like, wait, what? I'm like, what charm? What are you talking about? Are you saying this is magic? Like, what? <laughs> and then Constance spends the rest of that being really annoyed with Alexis, but then she's still kind of attached to the, to the old man while she's singing it. So I had a lot of fun with this. And I think the music is great. When it comes to the Sorcerer's ranking, I think this is very much average when it comes to the music of the Sorcerer. So I don't think it would have changed the Sorcerer's placement at all. And now coming to the one which uh, I cannot believe I, I forgot about. I think that what happened was I'd at one point put it in the showstoppers list and then maybe discussing it with Marisa we decided oh maybe it shouldn't go in there. So probably what I'd done was I bet I'd copied it and then cut it meaning to paste it somewhere else and I probably got distracted and didn't do it. Copy and paste error but that is, I'm so happy that Joanna noticed that I'd forgotten to talk about this one because actually this number is genuinely one of my favourite in the canon and let me tell you why that is. So when you consider that Trial was Gilbert and Sullivan's first big success, I don't know if in Thespis there were any numbers that were remembered as being particularly witty. Little Maid of Arcady I know got published individually and that was very successful. Climbing Over Rocky Mountain was used again, but certainly Little Maid of Arcady was the success number from Thespis, but I don't I don't think it would have been successful. This is just me guessing. I don't know. But I don't imagine it would have been successful necessarily for its wittiness. I just think the music is very pretty. It's just so re rememberable. The opposite of forgettable. Memorable. <laughs> it's just a really pretty, gorgeous number, and I like... But we're not talking about that number. I honestly think that... When Try by Jury happened, to some extent, the Usher song, which I've already talked about, when, when he kind of goes between these emotions, oh, listen to the plaintiff's case, observe the features of the face from bias real. That's a kind of funny, like, bipolarism. Like, I love how that mood, like, switches, and that's very funny. So we do get that. But honestly, oh, hail great judge which is when the judge enters and the chorus all stand up and sing very powerfully about this immense foreboding figure that is walking on the stage. We have no idea at this point about what patter people are supposed to be like. When people think of patter guys today, they imagine John Reed and somebody being kind of like silly and a bit quirky. But this to me is very much the first kind of traditional patter person in GNS. And there's not really been any other character like this. There wasn't really a character like him in the Thespis. So he immediately just marks himself out as something really special and unusual. I don't know if they were doing this in other operas, but when the judge comes on and he says, um, I'll tell you how I came to be a judge. He'll tell us how, he'll tell us how. When that lovely kind of, I, I want to say it's fugal. Is that fair? I don't know about that. They'll tell us how, he'll tell us how. You know what? It, what's interesting is I remember talking about 10 minutes since in the Grand Duke and saying, does any other opera have like, my gracious pass, my gracious, gracious pass. But actually, it's, it's a little bit like this. He'll tell us how, he'll tell us how, he'll tell us how he came to be a judge. But... Honestly, the the moment where the judge says, let me speak, let him speak, let him speak, that whole back and forth section with the let me speak, let me speak, that the, the tennis and bass is coming in, or maybe it's just the bass is coming in, and he'll tell us how, that is honestly one of the funniest moments in the Gilbert and Sullivan operas. It is an example, and I've said this before, but I can't remember where. To me, oh, hail great judge, and especially the let him speak section going back and forth, that to me is actually the funniest Gilbert and Sullivan moment that does not need any layering of acting. You don't need to think of anything. You don't need to 
think, right, I need to be feeling a certain emotion when I say this. The material is funny in itself. Like, just reading the text is funny. <laughs> and there's something about the solemnity and the gravitas of the music which just makes it even funnier. He'll tell us how, he'll tell us how, he'll tell us how, he'll tell us how he came to be a judge. Tell us how, he'll tell us how, he'll tell us how, he'll tell us how. And the judge is like, well, are you going to let me speak? <laughs> yes, let him speak. Hush, hush, he speaks. Hush, hush, he speaks. Hush, hush. He'll tell us how, he'll tell <laughs> Silence in court. Oh, the, the, the usher coming at the end there, you know, rehashing that amazing motif that he has. Like, this is possibly, when it comes to not really thinking of necessarily music or dramatic emotional stakes or anything else, but when it comes to pure comedy, th this is one of my favourite moments in the canon. It, it is just absolute genius, and I will never ever get tired of hearing this. And if you just consider as well that, you know, Gilbert and Sullivan were not well known at this point, and people seeing this, like before Le Pericle in 1875, 76, would, their minds would have been blown by this and how clever that was. I don't know if anyone else was kind of making like meta jokes about how silly opera is, about how these characters, like, he, he, the judge wants to speak, but he has to have this big grand introduction. And also him getting this grand introduction when he's a really silly character as well, which we learn, you know, reach our promise we to try today. <laughs> he's just such a, a warm, but quite apathetic, <laughs> like eccentric character. I, I love the judge. I mean, I don't think he ranked particularly highly in my characters. <laughs> video because he doesn't he isn't really very deep but certainly as as I've been saying a lot I do think that we have to judge trial by jury a little bit differently for what it is it's absolutely perfect and you can't say that about operas like The Sorcerer I feel like even though I, I love every single GNS opera but you can identify I think where each opera has its weakness. I would say Sorcerer is its kind of concept and characters. Pirates is, again, probably just its lack of relatability of the characters and just its overall kind of musical below averageness when it comes to the whole canon. The same with HMS Pinafore, even if the characters are, I think, are really great in HMS Pinafore, but you've got this sense that, um, the music maybe just isn't as good as some of the other operas. I think Patience also, like people maybe think the music isn't quite as good as some of the other ones. Iolanthe is like a really good all-rounder, I think, but it never really reaches the top of any list for me. Princess Ida, I think its dialogue is is really not very good. <laughs> the Mikado doesn't really have many weaknesses at all, but again, does it reach the top of every list? I wouldn't say so. Rudigal, I, I would say that it's just, it's narrative. Is maybe a little bit weak in Rudigore, especially in Act Two. And the Omen of the Guard, I think the narrative is overall relatively weak, but that's the only thing you can say about Yeoman. I think Yeoman's like got loads of strengths. Generally, I think Gondolier is just is just lacking the depth of character that I think some of the operas have. Utopia Limited, again, I think that like the narrative and Gilbert's focus was just a bit missing, and maybe like some other characters aren't as vibrant. But I, th I think it's, the music's actually great. And then Grand Duke, I think the, the problem with Grand Duke, I think, is its um, general uh, kind of lack of narrative focus as well. It's more just a, a sequence of fun things that are happening. But, you know, a reminder that I love all of these operas. It's just, it's just me nitpicking. And I'm just making the point that when it comes to Trial by Jury, there's not a single thing wrong with Trial by Jury. Like, literally, it's just perfect. And... In that sense, it is the winner, <laughs> but um, it's just not long enough to get any kind of like depth of complexity of character, which is maybe the same problem that the gondoliers has. So maybe Trial by Jury and Gondoliers are kind of quite similar in that respect, that they are both just kind of utterly perfect for what they are, but just 
to some people's tastes, like mine, they just kind of maybe lack some complexity. This moment of trial by jury is probably my favourite moment of trial by jury, which makes it further like absolutely mad that I somehow missed it off every list that I did. But that does not mean that I don't like this song. In fact, I think it is my best moment of trial by jury. So is O'Hale Great Judge good enough that it may have actually pushed trial by jury above the next one in the music list? I don't know. I don't know if really musically it's anything particularly special. I think its talents more come in the kind of comic uh, dramaticness. My uh, musical scores ranged from 107 points to 252 points. I won't go into the scoring system now, <laughs> you can learn about that in the video itself, but Trial was a full 21 points behind its next one, so I don't think the music alone of this one would have bumped it up above the one above it, but certainly when it comes to musical numbers, maybe it will make a difference, so I'm very glad that Joanna pointed this one out. But yeah, I don't think any of these forgotten numbers would, would have really made a difference to any of the rankings. Uh, Utopia Limited was still very much above the one below it. In fact, the one below it was a full 16 points lower than it. So this Tarantella, it would not have ranked low enough down the list to pull that one down. It may have lost a couple of points, but it wouldn't have lost 16 points for that one song. So my music rankings, I think, are still accurate, but maybe the musical numbers rankings will change. And I am so relieved and thrilled and thankful that Joanna Brabs pointed out to me that I hadn't talked about it, because now you get pretty much a whole video about it. So thank you to Joanna. Thank you for everyone watching. Please do subscribe to my channel. Once this list is over, you'll have lots more short videos like this where I just talk about one song or I talk about one aspect of the GNS operas that's maybe not being talked about. Maybe I'll talk about some kind of common arguments that happen on, on the forums and talk about my opinion about what those people are saying because I like pettiness and I like gossip and if anyone says they don't like drama, that they're probably lying to you. And I, I, I quite like drama in the GNS community. I'll talk to you about spinning wheels. Maybe I'll talk to you about the spinning wheel controversy. If you can think of any other numbers I've forgotten, do let me know. Joanna pointed out that she, she thought I'd forgotten um, Oh Joy A Spoon, but actually I did talk about that in the trios video. It's not really a trio, but that's where I put it. And she also mentioned that I didn't really talk about Are You Peeping, Can You See Me? and uh, Good Morrow Pretty Maze, but I, I actually do think it was a mistake to include my papa in the numbers list because they're just not substantial. And I ended up also taking out one of the Good Morrow Good Lovers, Good Morrow Good Mothers from Iolanthe because it's just the same song twice. And I didn't think it was fair to have one drag down all the other numbers in Iolanthe. I haven't discussed those deliberately, but anything else you can think of, maybe I've still forgotten one, but tell me if I have. I love you all. Subscribe, please. And goodbye.